Hey good people, Big Heavy here. And one of my first videos was my garage tiling video. And over the years that it's been out there, there've been a number of questions on how, I've, how I did the project, whether I do it again, all that sort of thing. So today I'd like to answer your top nine. Number 10 was cut out due to our current inflationary environment. Top nine questions on tiling your garage floor. So we'll step into the shop and we'll get right to it. So question one, how's the floor holding up after seven, eight-ish years since I did this project? And the answer is pretty darn well. We generally don't park cars in here, but it is kind of our workout room. It's my general workshop. Uh, you know, we do everything from throw kettlebells around in here to cleaning firearms, building stuff, all the you know, usual things that one would do in a workshop. And the tiles frankly held up great. You know, I think the only damage, if you could call it that, that I've seen is there's a rampant spider problem out here. Spiders seem to love this place and whatever spiders that tend to hang out in this garage produce some weird acid that kind of stains the floor. Other than that, there's been some little like funky stuff that's kind of come up where the grout lines are. I assume that's because the subfloor still has a little bit of moisture in it. And typically after a big rain, we'll get these weird crystal deposits. But it's all up great. You know, I've dropped, dropped stuff on here. I used to park motorcycles in here back when I was cool enough to ride motorcycles before I had kids. Now I'm decidedly uncool. It's held up excellent. And I think that kind of is a testament to the quality of the materials, the tile I used. And I'd like to say the technique, but I was kind of learning as I go. So question number two, what type of tile should I buy? Had this one several times. And you know, obviously get something that you like the look of, get something that's a size that you like, that's sort of discretionary, I guess. I think bigger, frankly, to some extent is easier to work with because you end up having to cut less of it. You know, it's, it gets a little bit unwieldy the larger the tile is, but this tile size seems to work pretty well. I think this is essentially like one, uh, one foot by about two and a half feet. But there are a few key things you want to look out for. And first of all is your tile material. So in my case, I went with porcelain tile. Porcelain is generally a little more expensive than ceramic, but it's also a little bit more stronger, a little bit more kind of industrial grade, I would say. So I would definitely steer you towards porcelain versus ceramic if you can swing the cost. Other factor you want to look at is the hardness rating, which is measured on PEI. I don't know what PEI stands for, I can't remember, but generally four or five is kind of the hardest. That's more of an industrial grade tile. Generally, the porcelain is uh, is usually what gets that PEI four or five rating. I haven't seen much ceramic that's that's got that four or five rating. So you want that rating. And then the third kind of critical factor I'd look with is how slippery is the tile, particularly when wet. And there are some tiles will have like a drag coefficient rating or something like that. But what I'd recommend is get some samples of the tile you like, obviously for aesthetic purposes, but then I'd also take those and once you have your two or three finalists that have the look that you want, put some water on them and just rub your hand over them. You know, take whatever shoes you typically wear, you know, slide those around on them. Cause I was surprised some of the tiles when they get a little damp, they're, you know, they're like ice. And if you live in the Northeast or something and you're gonna be parking cars in there and your tile's gonna be wet typically if you're you know, doing a garage gym and if you're like me and sweat like a fat kid at the buffet, you're gonna get some dampness on those tiles and they're gonna get slick. So make sure you get something that keeps a, keeps a degree of traction even when it's wet. Third question I've had quite a bit from the audience is how hard a job is this for a DIYer? And you know, I would say I'm kind of an advanced DIYer maybe and don't mean to be giving myself more credit than, uh, than is ultimately due, but you know, I've ended up building things like a tree house. You know, I've done most of the work to assemble this garage after it was framed. I've done electrical and plumbing and that sort of thing. So I'd probably, you know, on the, the savvier side of the, the DIY scale. And I would say, you know, a 10 being a project that I would you know, probably not do and would ultimately end up outsourcing because it was too complex or too difficult. And a one being, you know, hanging a, a picture on a wall or something really simple. I would probably call this like an eight. And I call it an eight for a few reasons. You know, number one, it's a physically relatively demanding job. You're dealing with 50 pound buckets and bags of thin set, which is kind of the, the cement that you use to bond the tile to the floor. You know, you've got to mix that stuff up. It's a pretty heavy duty slurry. You know, the tiles themselves are, uh, you know, are not light. Individual tiles are, uh, are not you know, heavy by any means, but you're dealing with stacks and moving things around quite a bit. And there's a weird combination of like strength and kind of artistry to setting tile I found. And you know, maybe pros are kind of laughing and thinking I'm overhyping that. But for me anyway, 
you, know, you have to work fast enough that your 50 pound bucket of thin set doesn't spoil. You know, essentially after about 90 minutes, it gets a little funky and doesn't quite work anymore. You're laying this stuff down on the floor, you're troweling it out, and then you've got to put the tile down, get everything lined up, get it even out with the, with the tiles next to it. Otherwise you have what's called lippage where, you know, the tiles are kind of at different heights. And if you drag your foot across, you know, you'll feel all sorts of bumps in there. There's a lot of things to watch out for. And you know, that's kind of the artistry piece. So it's not the world's easiest job, but it was also one of the more rewarding jobs I've done. You know, there's some things that are hard and they're just, you know, hard, like dealing with uh, you know, mixing cement or pouring footers or something like that is just a, a hard job. But this was kind of fun and rewarding. Like it had this nice sort of Zen state when I was doing the tiling, even though it probably took me, you know, 16 X longer than a pro doing it. But it was a, you know, one of those jobs that was kind of enjoyable and rewarding. So if you're kind of on the fence, you know, I would say go for it. Um, you know, a garage is a big project in terms of size and time commitment, but there's not a lot of challenge to it versus doing something like a, you know, a very ornate backsplash where you have to work around a bunch of different level things. You know, kind of in the garage, you've got, uh, you know, that outside perimeter. And then once you're in the middle, the field of tile, you're just sort of sailing right along. So in terms of, you know, complexity of a tiling job, I don't think a garage is a, a bad one to start with. It was the first tiling job I ever did. If you're on the fence, I'd say go for it. Question four, what kind of prep do I need? I've had this one a few times. And the prep is, I would say, fairly straightforward versus doing something like putting down an epoxy floor where you've got to rent a diamond grinder and do all kinds of crazy stuff. For me, it was mostly a matter of kind of washing out the garage. Most garages are sloped, so there's a gentle slope from the back of the garage to the front door. So you can kind of just get in here with a hose, and as long as you're not going crazy and you know, spraying all your walls, just sort of hose everything out. You know, maybe get in there with, uh, with a push broom or something and just give it a good cleanup. And then you wanna make sure the floor is generally level. So what I did was take a big old long level, kind of go around and anywhere where there's a little bit of a dip of more than maybe an eighth or quarter of an inch, I just take a, you know, a Sharpie or something, put some X's on the floor, and then they have some, uh, I forget what it's called, I think it's called floor leveling compound. And it's essentially kind of like a thin set-ish thing, but a little more flowy. So you put that guy in, you kind of even them out, and that's how what you can use to fill in any sort of gentle dips in your floor. And you'll probably find some, I didn't find a ton since my floor was relatively new but I did have to do that in a couple sections and you can watch that, uh, that tile video, that kind of time-lapse one with the music that everyone hates, but hey, it was royalty free and, and goofy. Um, and sort of see in the beginning, just the process of washing out the floor, you know, sweeping, doing a little vacuuming in the corner of the shop vac, and then putting in that floor leveling stuff. Question five, what are expansion joints and how do I deal with them? So expansion joints are essentially cuts in your concrete floor, and you do this with any large span of concrete. If you're walking down the street and walking on a, along a sidewalk, you'll see you know, every five or six feet, there's a little cut across. And if you get down on your hands and knees and kind of look closely, you'll see that it's uh, you know, it only extends maybe a inch or so, maybe a little less than an inch into the concrete. It's not actually like you know two separate pieces of concrete. It's kind of a groove cut in an extended piece of concrete. And what those do is they're kind of a intentional weak point in the concrete. So if it's gonna crack, since the big old piece of concrete's moving around with the dirt and whatever is shifting underneath it, it's gonna crack along that expansion joint. And you know, obviously that will look nice since your expansion joint is a nice straight sort of pre-cut in your concrete versus having a big old crack in the middle of the floor where things get uneven and get all crazy. And in a typical garage floor like mine, there's an expansion joint kind of running north-south and then one running east-west. So it sort of looks like a, you know, an evenly divided big square cut into four you know, evenly sized smaller squares. And ultimately what you want to do is, you know, what I heard termed as respect the expansion joint. And what that means is essentially my floor, rather than being just one giant tiled floor, is kind of like four mini tiled floors that are connected together. And right over the expansion joint, instead of having a piece of tile covering that or having tiles that are grouted together, I essentially left a gap about the same size as the expansion joint and put some special caulk in there. So they have color match caulk that'll match the color of your grout. So it essentially, you know, unless you get close, looks about the same. It's obviously a little wider than the grouted joints, but you know, similar color and you don't really notice it unless you're, you're kind of looking for it there. But what that does is it allows those four separate sections of the concrete subfloor to move, to do what they need to do, and not have the tile kind of fighting against them. 
if I did just tile this as a monolithic single tile floor, the risk I'd run is as the concrete moves and kind of moves a little separately based on those expansion joints, it might be wrestling with the tile floor and then you end up with, you know, a big old crack in the floor somewhere or some cracks along the epoxy line or just, you know, kind of the floor and the concrete subfloor fighting with each other and creating some structural issues. Now, again, if you go back and kind of watch that, uh, that time-lapse video, it might be a little hard to see, but what I did was clean out that expansion joint real nice during my floor cleaning process. I put a backer rod in there, which is, you, know, you can almost think of it as like a little tiny pool noodle, you know, about a, uh, I think I use an inch in diameter one. They have various sizes, so get something that kind of fits in your expansion joint. You jam that backer rod down to the expansion joint, you put some uh, self-leveling caulk over it, so that kind of covers that up and creates an even surface. And then you run your tile right up to the edge of that expansion joint, and you can see that I you know, cut my tiles so they ended at the expansion joint, and then left that joint empty. And when I did my grouting, I went back and then put a line of caulk, was kind of my last step in that, uh, that expansion joint area that I had left in the tile. The other thing you could do, but it got a little too advanced and complex for me, is you can do what's called floating the floor. So you can put, there's a special membrane that'll go between all your tile and your subfloor. So it's essentially, you think of it like a giant, you know, tarp or sheet of plastic or something. And it's, you know, obviously made of some specialized material. There's some adhesives that you use to kind of get that thing set in there. And then you put your tile on top of that. So essentially it disconnects, I think it's actually the technical term is an isolation membrane. It disconnects your tile floor from the subfloor. So if the tiles, you know, moving north south, your subfloor can kind of move east west, and they're sort of independent from each other. For me, that was a bit of fairly significant additional cost versus just the backer rods and the, the caulking, and it was also a fairly high degree of complexity. I think that was sort of an advanced technique that I didn't want to get into. The thing I would remember if I was doing DIY, you know, look at that isolation membrane option if you want to think through that, or if you're you know, having someone do your garage floor or tiling your garage floor for you. If you're doing it yourself, you know, remember to respect those expansion joints and just essentially make sure that you're not tiling over them, that you're actually sort of stopping your floor, you know, you're, sep you're joining your tile with caulk, so there's that flexibility between the different sections versus kind of creating one giant tile section that could get you into trouble later. Next question that I had from several folks is, what do you do with the edge of your floor, kind of around the border? And this is something I agonized over for a long, long time. And there's kind of two problems, at least with my specific floor. So my garage was built on cinder blocks, so there was kind of a you know cinder block perimeter on the three sides with the open garage door on the, the fourth side, and the floor is uneven. You know, as I mentioned earlier in the video, most garages slope outwards towards the garage door. So if you park in you know a vehicle that's all covered in snow or slush or whatever, or you're just you know doing something with water in your garage or something leaks, it all sort of flows towards the door and you know hopefully runs out and doesn't cause a problem. But I was trying to figure out, you know, what do I do with the cinder blocks? Do I just tile up to them and put some cord around and then have this janky bit of cinder block showing around the perimeter of the garage? And at least for my solution, what I did was I took PVC or plastic trim. I think there's three or four different brand names that it goes under. But essentially, rather than wood, it's a hunk of plastic, but it can be cut like wood. It's designed to look like, you know, pre-painted wooden trim. And I got that and I got some plastic cord around and essentially built a little cap over the cinder box. And I anchored that trim to the cinder box with some Tapcon screws. Tapcon's a pretty common cement anchor screw. And I also hit it with a little construction adhesive. So essentially the construction adhesive is kind of what holds these, uh, these trim pieces onto the cinder block. And the screws sort of were what I used to apply a little pressure versus some elaborate clamping mechanism. And I covered those guys up with some putty, you know, same as you would with trim nails, and then ultimately painted. And I left a little bit by the door because I was going to put some non-skid padding in there, but that'll give you a nice chance to kind of see what uh, what I'm talking about. You can kind of see how I did this. And my process was, you know, I'd kind of measure in a couple or three places around the perimeter of the garage to get that slope. I'd cut one piece of trim, you know, at a light angle using either a jigsaw or if I could, you know, kind of pull it off the circular saw. And then I put a cap on top of that, which was a little easier to cut since that length was pretty consistent and then use some cord around on the top and bottom to kind of hide all my flaws and measurements. You know, most carpenters will tell you that uh, that trim hides all sins, and this is obviously a good case of that. And then my final step was to add a little caulk and kind of neaten everything up, and you know, I think it looks pretty good. So you, know, you can judge for yourself, but at least that was the approach that I took. All right, question seven, what special tools do you need? I'm not gonna give you an exhaustive list. I'll kind of hit the ones that are unique to tiling 
But the first one I'd recommend, you know, maybe seems a little less obvious, but get yourself a good set of knee pads. You're gonna spend a lot of time on your knees. You know, I had some like $10 specials that I got from Home Cheapo or something and very quickly upgraded to, you know, the ones that were like 40, 50 bucks with the gel and the plastic things and all that stuff. So you're essentially, you know, doing this whole project on your knees and you're gonna get the equivalent of doing, you know, 500 squats a day, kind of going up, getting your tile, getting down, setting everything, you know, moving stuff around and all that stuff. So your knees are a lot more expensive to replace than a lot of other things. So get yourself some good knee pads first and foremost. Second thing you're gonna need is a tile saw. Now you can rent those and you know, my general opinion on renting tools, and it might be driven in part because I'm super slow because I'm a DIYer, is it's easier to buy something that's pretty good, that's new, that's gonna work, and you know, have it as long as you need it, not having to worry about getting it back to a rental agency in some you know, tight time frame or something like that, and then sell it on Craigslist. You know, I've done that with nail guns, uh, framing nailers, I've done that with my tile saw. I've done that with any kind of specialized tool that I'm gonna need for a couple or three months that I'm gonna get rid of, and you know, usually I'll end up spending less than I would have renting it. And the pro tip I'll give you for a tile saw is this is one area where Harbor Freight has a pretty darn good industrial tile saw. I think it's under their Chicago brand. I'll try and link to it down in the description if I remember to, uh, to do so. But there's two kind of pro tips for this thing. And it's nice, it's on a big table, it has its own stand. You know, it's the industrial one, not the little cheesy kind of one. I think it ran like four or 500 bucks. But the two pro tips are, first of all, they give you a really crappy water pump with it, apparently. And you need a water pump and a tile saw because it essentially blasts water on the tile and that's how it lubricates the blade. And the trick there is generally, if you had a good water pump, you'd kind of put it in the tray. There's a tray on a tile saw where there's this big water bath and it catches the water, pumps it over the blade and sort of recycles it to keep the thing going. But with that Harbor Freight pump, what you do is get yourself a big old five gallon bucket, put it next to the saw, drop your pump in there. That way it's in clean water and it doesn't kind of kill itself by sucking in used tiley water. And it'll last, you know, forever. It lasted me through all my tile projects, basically because I was pumping that clean water in there. And all you have to really do is remember to refill the bucket every now and then and kind of dump out the, the tray under the tile saw. Second pro tip with that thing is there's like a $50 upgrade, which is go and get yourself a DeWalt diamond tipped tile saw blade. Obviously make sure it's the right size for the saw. The one Harbor Freight gives you is pretty janky, but if you throw that DeWalt guy on there, you know, this is PEI 5 porcelain tile and it cut that stuff like butter. And that one tile blade lasted me through, you know, my 25 by 24 ish shop, as well as a shower and bathroom upstairs. So, you know, one blade will get you through a pretty good project. You're also gonna need some other specialized tools. You're gonna need some trowels. You know, there's certain size trowels you use depending on the size of the tile you use. You can look that up on, you know, various tile websites. I would also get yourself one of those big industrial uh, stirring things that you put on the end of a drill. And I would get yourself the Harbor Freight plug-in. I think it's like a half amp or, you know, kind of the big hog drill. It's got one of those side things that you'd usually use to auger holes. I use that to stir up my thin set. You can kind of get by with a decent cordless drill, but you're probably gonna beat the hell out of it because that thin set's pretty, you know, thick and heavy duty stuff. So get yourself that Harbor Freight one. I think it's like 40, 50 bucks. You plug it in. I use that to stir the thin set and for nothing else. Then I was done with the tile project. I was able to sell that Harbor Freight tile saw and that Harbor Freight drill as a package. And I think I ended up you know, eating like 50, 60 bucks or something at the end of the day, which is probably a lot less than it would have been to rent a tile saw for the you know, month and a half, two months I, it took me to finish this project. The final specialized tool I'd highly recommend is a leveling system. And the pro tilers, you know, I think kind of look at this as a, a bit of a cheat. You know, essentially it's a way to make sure your tiles are level and to kind of lock and hold them in place and make sure they're evenly spaced versus, you know, doing it through pure skill. And in this case, you know, I'm really happy with the end result. I've had a couple people that actually, you know, set tile for a living come in here and tell me it was a pretty good job. The test they tell you is to slide a quarter across and if you can slide all the way across your room, you've done good. If the thing you know bounces and deflects off into space, then you've got some lippage, which again is that spacing or that I mean unevenness between tiles. So I was happy with that, and I owe it all to what I use was the Raimondi tile leveling system. I'll link to that down below. There's three or four others. I'll link to those. That Raimondi one I liked. You know, it's made in Italy, I think. And if I learned anything living in Italy, it's that those MFs like to tile. I think if you stand around Naples for too long, somebody will end up tiling you. 
Um, so I would trust anything from Italy or Mexico when it comes to tile, just because every time I've been to those two places, there's a lot of tile and it's pretty damn nicely laid. Question number eight, what materials do I need and where do I buy them? So obviously you're gonna need some tile. I got mine from build.com and I got it on some sort of closeout deal. As I mentioned, it's held up great. I actually saw the same tile, as best as I can tell, the local Tesla dealership. And you know, Teslas have gigantic batteries in them, so they weigh a zillion pounds and you know, everything seemed to be holding up just fine in there. So I'm pretty confident this could hold up to all sorts of vehicle traffic and that sort of thing, assuming you do a good installation. But I would recommend you go to your local tile store. And you know, there's this whole world of trade stores, and I've talked about these in some of my other videos related to building stuff. But you know, essentially, you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, and they have you know generally decent stuff, but it's catering towards homeowners, and it's you know sort of general stuff. So if you go in the tile section, you know they have nice tile, uh, they have three or four kinds of thin set, they have you know most of the tools you need, but they're probably not going to have like that PEI five industrial porcelain tile. If they do, they're gonna have one or two and not, you know, 10 of them. So I ended up getting my actual tile on build.com. They ended up shipping it to me on some pallets. But I after ordering that from build, I went to my local tile shop. Some of them will have a showroom where you go in and it's, you know, usually attractive ladies with clipboards and beautiful bathrooms and setups that you look in and, and sort of put out your dream kitchen. But then the back is where the people that actually set tile go. And there's stores like this for plumbing, there's stores like this for electrical, you know, irrigation, kind of each trade has its own little store. And what I recommend is, you know, go during the off hours. Don't go at like six to 9 a.m. on Monday, because that's when all the real people that actually do this for a living are going and you're just gonna you know, piss everyone off if you don't know what you're doing. But go at like, you know, two in the afternoon on a you know, Wednesday-ish, you know, go in there and say, you know, hey, I'm tiling my garage, you know, here's what I wanna do, here's what I'm gonna put on there. And generally you'll get somebody that knows what the hell they're talking about. You know, it's somebody that's, you know, maybe been in the trade, somebody that if nothing else deals with trades people all day. So they know what's up and, you know, they usually focus on one or two manufacturers. And so they know their product really well. And particularly on something like a garage, you know, the thin set you use can have a big impact. You wouldn't use the same thing for a kitchen backsplash as you'd want to use for a garage floor. So when I went in there, you know, the guys sat down with the product catalogs and they're like, all right, you know, this, the one I went to sold Laticrete thin set. You know, we were looking through data sheets and specs and, you know, he was telling me how they had this new thing out and, you know, here's why it was great for a garage floor. If I didn't want to spend that much, you know, here's another grade. But they know what they're talking about, essentially. And by virtue of going to these places, you know, you'll get that expertise. You'll get somebody that knows something. They have, you know, esoteric stuff that would be a special order from a Lowe's or a Home Cheapo, and it's, you know, just sitting in the back there. And you can kind of get whatever you need. They'll have tools, they'll have sponges, they'll have anything you need as a, a tile dude or do that. And you can throw it in the back of your truck and off you go. So in terms of, you know, where to buy your stuff and, you know, what kind of specialized materials to use, I would definitely go to a place like that. And I would definitely make sure you, know, you have something that's specific to a garage floor type application. You don't want to go and get the, you know, the Home Cheapo or Lowe's special that's great for your tile backsplash, but then you roll your car over it and you know, you've got cracked tiles all over the place. All right, last question from you, the fantastic audience and fans of this crazy thing I call the Big Heavy YouTube channel is, would I do it again? And you know, seven years later, I would say unequivocally yes. Yeah, the tiles held up great. It's fairly easy to clean, you know, despite the fact that all my little tile shots have been pretty dirty and gross because I haven't uh, gotten to my spring cleaning yet. It's probably been a good year since I've, I've done a good clean out of this place. You know, it's pretty low maintenance. Nothing's broken, nothing's cracked. You know, everything looks great. Once a year, we kind of pull everything out of the garage and it's a pretty simple matter of mopping everything down. You know, I know people that'll just get in here with a hose and blast away. I don't want to get, you know, water all over the drywall and don't want to have to move every single shelf out. So I'll just kind of back out anything that's mobile, you know, hit everything with a mop and the tile essentially looks as good as new other than that sort of weird spider acid splatters that, uh, that don't seem to clean off very well. I think also it looks a little better and, you know, I like it a little more than the epoxy garage floor. I know people that have the epoxy and love it and are very happy with it, but to me, it's kind of generic. You know, epoxy floor is uh, something you see all the time. Garage tile floor is a, a little less uh, less common. 
you know, I like being in here. I like, you know, getting in here and working out and not having to worry about stuff. You know, there's uh, there's good traction if I come in here and my shoes are wet or whatnot. I don't have to worry too much about drop, dropping stuff. You know, I've dropped sledgehammers, we've dropped kettlebells and, and barbells and that sort of thing. My wife's the big uh, strength person in the family. So, you know, she's lifting big old dumbbells. I'm, you know, rocking three or four pound little goofy things because I'm a, a girly man. I say, don't be a girly man. But, you know, we've never had any problem with, uh, with any sort of damage or anything. So unequivocally, yes. You know, in the midst of it, it was uh, it was a bit of a challenging project. It was a bit tough, but I've heard the same thing about a good epoxy floor. You know, you need to get in there with a diamond grinder. You need to do a lot of prep. You need to acid etch the things and you know, really get after it or you end up with, you know, I've seen dozens of those bad epoxy floor jobs where things are bubbling and kind of janky after a few years. This floor looks great after seven years, you know, other than the spiders and you know, having to clean up those little weird mineral crystals that grow after hard rain. I've got no complaints whatsoever. So I'd highly recommend it. You know, I think it's DIY-able if you're, uh, you're willing to learn and, and willing to be patient. You know, the, probably the pro tip I'd give you on the DIY front is just be careful with cleaning up the thin set after you put your tiles down. I didn't do a good job of that initially and it's, it's a bear to grind that stuff out to get ready for grouting. So highly encourage it. If you do have any other questions, throw them in the comments. I do read the comments and respond to every comment that is rational and reasonable. If you like these sort of videos where I talk through projects and that sort of thing and show off my terrible hobo beard that I'm trying to grow out, Hit up the uh, subscribe and like and all that stuff, and I will see you in the next one. Big Heavy wishing you happy trails and happy tiling. Peace.